So welcome back everybody to another webinar organized by Princeton for everyone worldwide. Uh, we're very happy to have uh, James Stock with us from Harvard University. Hi, Jim. Hi, nice to be here. Thank you. Great to have you. And uh, Jim will talk about macroeconomics, carbon pricing, and climate policy. And uh, he follows in the tradition of other webinars we had before here on the climate change. And so we'll learn more. Next week, actually, we will have Bill Nordhaus, who will also talk about climate change. It's a very, very important topic, and we really want to cover it here. Earlier, we had Esteban Rossi Hansberg here, who talked about climate change and geography and migration aspects. He also introduced the concept of carbon taxing as flattening the curve. So you lose, you use actually less energy in the near future. So you flatten the curve, but then energy will be cheaper down the road because there's still more oil in the ground. And that's actually, you will actually then use more energy and more oil, let's say in the future. So you essentially uh, have a, a dynamic trade-off here. And in June, we had Richard Zeckhauser with us, also from Harvard, talking about the different ways of um, dealing with climate change, the three different ways, mitigation, adaptation, and uh, amelioration. In particular, he was favoring geoengineering and how important geoengineering is in order to achieve our aims. Today, we will hear much more how climate change interacts with the macroeconomy. So very much looking forward uh, to that. So in general, I would like to come back. We have these two approaches. We have a Malthusian approach, an innovation approach. And the Malthusian approach is essentially a huge supply side shock. We essentially don't produce so much anymore, cut back on our consumption. And that reduces very much GDP, reduces employment. And of course, it's a supply side shock. So it's also inflationary uh, to a large extent. And on top of it, there might be certain goods which are free for now that might be very costly. I think of, you know, you drink clean water now, later you might want to switch to some bottled water, suddenly something becomes costly. And that increases potential GDP, at least as we measure it. It might be also raise a lot of questions how we should measure GDP. And that's essentially some aspect uh, other speakers have talked earlier, but we might come back to this, how to measure GDP at some point too. But what I like the most about the Malthusian approach, uh, I don't like it, but uh, what I really uh, think is useful to think about, the COVID lockdowns were essentially hugely a Malthusian approach. And what's striking to me is that, you know, if you look at the decline in CO2 emissions, it was the most dramatic decline in CO2 emissions we ever experienced. So you can see, you know, the, the, you know, the demise of the Soviet Union and you see the global financial crisis had almost no impact on CO2, but some little impact, but this COVID crisis had the biggest impact on uh, the CO2 emissions. And that's taken from a recent Brookings paper, but in the big scheme of things, it's only a little dent. So it really didn't, I mean, it's a big decline, but it just throws us back to 2010 levels. It throws up, and then it's actually coming back very strongly. So that actually just going for the Malthusian approach, I think will, we will fail big time to save the environment and save the climate. And that's, I think, one main lesson one can take from the experiment of the COVID lockdowns. And of course, the alternative approach is to go for innovation. And the innovation, uh, you know, will require a lot of investment. And we probably will hear about the Biden plan, what uh, the new president of the United States is uh, pushing forward. And that would increase GDP because it will also lead to additional employment. And on the other hand, it might also make some resources cheaper later on, which might reduce the way we measure GDP. Uh, but that's coming back to Esteban's you know, flattening the curve aspect because you invest a lot today, but then actually there will be less uh, things to be done down the road. But in general, I think that COVID crisis has actually you know, discredited to some extent, in my view at least, the Malthusian approach and has highlighted the urgency and importance of going for innovation to resolve that. What else the COVID crisis did, essentially we come back to two earlier things we talked about. One is this QWERTY phenomenon. Remember that was the, uh, how the keys and the keyboard are assigned and the COVID, so we typically might be in some local optima here, optimum here, and we were stuck here, but the QWERTY could be, the COVID crisis 
shakes the whole system up and suddenly the ball can actually go down to a lot more global optimum. And you know, COVID guys is just a shake, shakes the system up and we can go in the long run to a better path. And right now we have to reestablish many things. And one thing we have to reestablish how we work and live together. So we redesign um, the locations where we work and whether we want to live in high rises or more lower rises, how the traffic will be designed. And that's what's referred, Nick Bloom referred to as the donut effect. So we're moving out of the centers of the cities and how we now design the cities will be designed essentially for a long time to come. So we should be very careful how we design it. And hence we should actually already have a clear path forward and carbon pricing might be one clear path could make the incentives right, how we design the cities down the road. And what's I think very important is the planning certainty that the guys who make the decisions how to design the new economy after COVID, that there are no with certainly what's coming. And that's why you would like to have either a clear carbon tax path where you say, okay, that will be, we start and ramp it up. We have a start with a certain carbon price and then we ramp it up, but it's pretty clear how it will evolve in the future. So people have some planning certainty they can make decisions and build uh, facilities which are corresponding to the expected prices. Of course, an alternative thing is instead of going for taxes, Peguvian taxes, we can go for pollution permits. So we trade pollution permits. That gives you planning certainty about uh, the, the emission level. So that's a different certainty. It's not about the price, it's about the emission level. And that's the trade-off we have to decide. You know, is it more important that individuals have a planning certainty with regard to the prices they face, or we need as a society more certain about the pollution levels more generally. But once you go for pollution permits, then there's the question, do you give the pollution permits away for free? And you know, a lot of industries in Europe got pollution permits for free, or you auction them off. So that's a redistributional issue. And you can also give some short-term permits which expire, or you have long-term permits, and then there's a central bank-like approach where there's, there's some authority buying and selling these permits, depending how the price evolves. So if you have a fixed number of pollution permits, it might be making the CO2 carbon price too, too volatile, but you could have an entity like a central bank taking pollution permits in and out, depending how the price evolves to smooth out uh, the price volatility. And essentially that's, you know, creating on top of it, even if you have pollution permits, you can actually smooth out some price paths to give some planning certainty for private uh, entities and firms who have to plan according to this. And of course you need some clear communication policy, how things will play out. So these are my brief opening remarks. All of this will affect the macroeconomy big time, the growth, the next decades we are facing. And I think that's now a natural point after COVID where you have to rethink anyway, many new investment projects to actually think more sustainable, think more long run and take this into account. So with this, I would like to come to uh, Jim's poll questions. And he asked us three questions and I would like to summarize uh, your answers and thanks for participating this way with the poll and later also throwing questions at me and Jim. Uh, so Jim's questions, the first question was over the next to 10 to 20 years is the effect of let's say a $40 carbon tax. What's the effect on the GDP level? Is it a big reduction? That's what the, about 13% 13 13 think. Is it a small reduction? That's 26% think it's negligible. That's actually the majority of things. Almost 50% think uh, it's negligible. And actually, uh, will it be a small increase? That's 13% opinion. And a big increase, only 2% think that's the case. So that's the impact on GDP. What's about the impact on employment? And um, it's uh, similar. So that it will be a big reduction in employment. It's only 4% think this way. Uh, that it will be a small reduction between minus 1% and minus 5%. That's about 23% of the people think that's, that's negligible. The majority, again, of 50% thinks this way. That it will be an increase, a small increase, 18%, and that it will be a big increase, only 3% think. And then the third question was, which policy, climate policy, will be the most effective one? If you can only pick a single one for the United States uh, again, so the technology policy will be 26% thinks this way. Direct government investment, so green infrastructure, banks, and so forth, 
uh, that's what the 13% think. And carbon tax, 55% think. So that's uh, the Pigou shining through. And uh, then the supply side policies banning certain things, uh, only 5% think. So the majority, big majority thinks we should go for carbon taxes. We haven't included here pollution permits, but I think that's probably all in one uh, carbon tax and pollution permits together. So with this, I pass on the floor, the virtual floor to Jim and looking forward to his um, insights and how the carbon tax and climate change will affect the macroeconomy and vice versa. Thanks again, Jim, great to have okay. you. Okay, okay, thanks very much. Um, let me make sure that I'm sharing my slide here. Does that look good? Perfect. Okay, great. So I, that was really interesting poll responses. It was uh, virtually symmetric around uh, negligible effect for um, the effect on aggregate employment. I think that's really interesting. And we'll see a little bit of empirical evidence on that, although at a different horizon. So thanks a lot. It's um, no pressure at all um, being sandwiched between Jay Powell and Bill Nordhaus. Uh, so that's, that's uh, thanks for that, Marcus. Um, I'm actually very pleased to be here. Uh, so the talk that I'm going to give today is uh, has some <laughs> academic content. So I'll be talking about a paper with Gib Metcalf on the effects of carbon pricing on macroeconomic outcomes uh, related to the poll. Um, but I'm going to take uh, some liberties uh, to go uh, a, a little more afield and talk about current uh, climate policy issues. Uh, I think one of the great things about this seminar series is that it's not just presenting uh, a specific uh, narrow academic paper, it's also talking about the broader context. And I'm going to take that opportunity uh, today. <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> all of a sudden, wow, you know, <clears throat> all of a sudden we're in a different world in so many ways uh, relative to a few days ago. And one of those ways is in what uh, seems to be on the, on the table and what the possibilities are for discussion about climate change policy. There were a couple of executive orders issued yesterday on climate change uh, issues. Um, uh, we expect more to come. Maybe they came out this morning and I just wasn't paying attention because I was working on the slides. They include rejoining Paris, uh, uh, stopping, uh, putting a pause on all of the regulation and reversing the deregulation, uh, uh, banning Keystone or putting a, a stop on um, Keystone XL, authorizing a revision of the social cost of carbon. And I think we'll see many more related things coming out of this. Uh, what I'd like to do is, so, so one of the challenges in climate uh, policy is that there's just, you could do a laundry list of different policies and it just gets huge. It gets hugely long, hundreds or if not thousands of different items and trying to figure out how they fit together. I think for somebody who's not working in this area, area narrowly is a big challenge, even how to put them in intellectual bins, how to think about organizing them. So part of what I'm going to do is talk about how they get organized and then talk about how these things fit together. I find it useful to think about these five bins that I have uh, right here. So a price on carbon, and, and I'm gonna be thinking about it as an economy-wide price on carbon. It doesn't have to be, it could just be in a sector or a couple of sectors, um, but I'll be thinking about it as economy-wide. There's some specific policies uh, that are uh, re relevant to the transportation sector and electric vehicles, and they relate to some of Marcus's remarks. Actually, Marcus made a couple of remarks, one about innovation and uh, innovating our way out of this problem. And some of that applies, uh, much of that applies in the transportation sector. He also referred to the QWERTY problem or a network externality. And the network externality is everybody's using the QWERTY keyboard, but we all wish we weren't. We wish we were using something more efficient. Uh, that's the way it is. We're stuck in a bad equilibrium. And you can think about the same challenge arising with electric vehicles and internal combustion engine vehicles because of uh, the availability of charging stations and service infrastructure and that sort of thing. Um, and then there's, uh, so there's R&D policy. And then there's a variety of supply side policies. So you're gonna hear an awful lot coming out of the treasury and you're starting to hear things coming out of the Fed and certainly coming out of the ECB. 
uh, about uh, things like financial disclosures. I guess everybody's probably quite, uh, everybody's heard of keep it in the ground, whether we should have Keystone XL and so forth. So I think of those, those are obviously very different policies. I think of them as being conceptually similar and that they're putting pressure on the supply side industries in one way or another. And then there's a bunch of things that uh, are, are, are really weedy issues that are actually quite important, which um, are probably only of interest to people who've served in uh, government. So I'll, I'm gonna try to organize those a little bit later. Um, so, I'm, but I'm gonna start by first of all, talking about at a high level about some of the challenges of the energy transition. So provide a couple of data slides. I'm gonna then focus on a carbon tax and in particular looking at macro effects of a carbon tax. And then I'm gonna narrow down to the power sector and look at some potential alternative policies to a carbon tax and see how they work. Uh, and, um, and then I'm gonna to return to this main list. So this is uh, sort of ambitious uh, and obviously some of what I'm going to be saying is going to be at a pretty high level, but I'm hoping that I can try to organize this in a way that's useful for, uh, for non-specialists non in this area. Uh, okay, so I know that whenever, so Marcus will have it just to be in an out, and whenever I listen to Marcus and the various panels that he's on talking about financial regulations, uh, in the banking sector, uh, it gets into the weeds really quick and it's really hard to keep, you know, where in the world does this actually fit into some organizing framework? So I'm gonna make, I'm gonna do my best to provide that. Okay, here's the scope of the challenge. So upper left, um, upper left uh, picture here is just, uh, I, I'm gonna be relying on some simulations. This one do is done by the um, Energy Information Administration in the US and I'm gonna be focusing just on the US. Uh, and we can come back to that in the Q&A if we want, but I'm gonna be focusing just on the US. So this is a Energy Information Administration uh, projection that they made about a year ago. And uh, the question is under existing policy, under the policies that were in place a year ago, what do we think is going to happen to overall aggregate emissions of CO2 from energy? And they've been going down, they peaked in about 2005 and they've been going down and they figure, the EIA figures that they'll be flat for a while and then they'll start to tick back up again. So that's our emissions path. Our Paris target before we, when we initially joined Paris and before we pulled out was this diamond right here. So we are gonna be missing the Paris target. And actually uh, we'll be looking at <clears throat> an upward trajectory of CO2 emissions. You can do a decomposition of the reasons for this decline. I think a lot of people say, this is, this is pretty good. Maybe we're on a good path here. You can do a decomposition of the reasons for that decline. Uh, and a useful way to do that is an identity called the Kaya identity, which says that CO2 emissions are the product of CO2 per energy, energy per GDP, GDP per capita and population. So you multiply those out. And so that holds in growth rates. If you imagine a business as usual or a base case, just the trend uh, going through 2005 and then you look at deviations from that trend. So we've actually, if you think about the trend, we're actually a long ways below that trend. We're 35 log points below that trend. Where did that 35 log point improvement come from? It came virtually evenly from a reduction in GDP per capita relative to that trend and from a, re a reduction of the CO2 intensity of energy from that trend. So an interesting point is that energy efficiency, we think we're doing a good job with LEDs and so forth that compared to trend made virtually no difference. We have a little bit less population growth. So that actually was beneficial for CO2 emissions. Um, the, pot, the GDP per capita, well, that's all the financial crisis and slow recovery. And then energy intensity of CO2, that sounds like a good thing. Maybe that's wind farms and solar panels and so forth, but actually that's not really quite what it is. It's natural gas substituting out coal because of fracking. So it's a substitution more or less of one fossil fuel for another. You can see what happens, what's happened here by fuel type, coal emissions have actually dropped quite a bit, but at the same time, natural gas emissions, this brown line have gone up and petroleum emissions, well, people stopped driving in the financial crisis, but then during the recovery, they started driving again. This all ends in the end of 2019, uh, so none of this has the, the blips of the uh, COVID crisis, but in, in this picture, as Marcus pointed out, those are blips. And I think we're, you know, we'll return to these fundamental trends. 
So uh, if you do a decomposition of why the energy sector, the power sector, excuse me, why the power, why there was the, the decline in coal, uh, well, this is this gives overall generation by different fuels, and you can see the generation by coal has declined quite a bit, and it's basically in the first instance been replaced by natural gas. Now, more recently, there's this little tiny blue line here, which is solar. And there's this higher blue line here, which is wind. And they've been making sort of, they've been plugging away. And recently they're making up some of this gap in terms of the decline of coal. But, but most of it is just actually um, produced by, is, is a result of, uh, of uh, fracking uh, and uh, cheap natural gas. We did a decomposition of that uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, uh, and, um, and you can just see that most of the decline in coal consumption is just the due to the relative price of coal versus gas. And that's not federal um, climate policy at all. It's just uh, track fracking. So, so the question is, you know, what do we need to do to um, displace this? So I did a little calculation. I said, suppose that you want to displace all natural gas and all coal by wind and solar. And uh, you want to do that in 2035. You have to allow for some emissions, uh, for some overall demand growth, um, although maybe not a lot, but some overall demand growth. You're going to have electric vehicles that need to be charged. Well, how much do you need to build? Okay, so this is this picture here in the upper left is um, the Rush Creek Wind Project. That's the largest wind uh, farm in the United States. It uh, came online uh, a couple of years ago at 600 megawatts. Uh, and this is the Solar Star solar facility came online in 2015. That's out in California, and it's the largest solar uh, utility scale solar panel farm uh, in the country. You can see it looks like a pretty good place for solar panels. Um, what do you need to do? Well, you need to buy 51 of these, and need to buy 55 of these, and you need to do that every year for the next 15 years. So I don't know, that seems like a lot. You need to build the largest one that we have basically every week and the largest one that we have basically every week for the next 15 years. It's a pretty big project. Can you quantify it in number, in dollars? Is it really- Oh, in so dollars? Good? Well, I don't know. You know, hopefully the price is gonna come down from economies of scale, but uh, no, I don't have the dollars off the top of my head. That's because I haven't added it to my card yet. So if I added it to my card, if I clicked here, then, it, then, I, then the dollars would show up. But it's out of, it's not my budget, so I don't know. Fair enough. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna, now let me turn to a carbon tax. So uh, there are a bunch of bills that were introduced uh, in the last legislation, last legislature uh, Congress, and I you know, expect more to be uh, introduced. There are come some legitimate interests. Obviously, if it were up to the voting members of the uh, AEA, we'd have a carbon tax right by now, but uh, we don't. Uh, and I think there's some legitimate concerns. And uh, one of those, is, uh, is jobs. And so that's what we're gonna look at, jobs in the economy. We might think, I think as economists, we would probably think about welfare, uh, but that's okay. Uh, again, we're not, the, we're, <laughs> we're, we're not the ones who get to decide here. The, uh, the politicians and a lot of people are concerned about jobs and GDP. Uh, in the Trump uh, pullout of the Paris Climate Accords, there was a direct concern about a number of jobs being lost. These are, by the way, big numbers. So 6.5 million uh, industrial jobs on a base of 140 something uh, jobs. So that's putting you down in the bottom bin of the worst case uh, of the worst uh, case outcomes uh, in, 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 uh, or just by uh, if you had to be in the Paris Climate Accords. There's other concerns, uh, concerns about um, regressivity. Uh, I'm not going to talk about those here. I think there's the, the standing approach to that is using a, ca a, ca a fee and dividend approach where the bulk of the revenues are re redistributed on a lump sum basis. Uh, there's some nuances to that. Maybe it would be lump sum by region or lump sum by rural, urban, or something along those lines, depending upon your carbon footprint or an average carbon footprint. But some lump sum redistribution tends to really get at the regressivity. There's legitimate concerns about impacted sectors. So coal mining employment, there's about 90,000 coal miners back in 2011, and that's down to around 50 something thousand. So coal mining has declined almost by half. Actually, it's more than half based on this year's data from the COVID crisis. Uh, that's impacts uh, in, in very specific states. 
So there's specific interest groups that are, um, that are <clears throat> quite uh, in directly impacted and communities that are gonna be very severely impacted by movement away from coal. Uh, and then there's the concern that uh, <clears throat> carbon tax alone won't produce necessary emissions reductions. I'm gonna agree with that concern completely and uh, we'll get back to this at the end. Okay. All right, so let me spend a little bit of time talking about uh, <clears throat> the macro aspects of a carbon tax. Um, so, uh, so now when I say macro aspects, what I'm really gonna be talking about is jobs and GDP. Uh, so a standard approach, the benchmark approach is to use uh, computable, general equilibrium, computable general equilibrium modeling in one way or another to uh, calculate what the effect of a different, uh, different carbon taxes are on the economy. Uh, there's a calculator that you can use. It's fun to play with on the RFF website and it implements uh, the E3 model of Goulder and Hafstead. And that just took this uh, from that, uh, from that uh, implementation. And what you can see is that according to their simulations, you look 15 years ahead and if you, uh, it exactly what the impact is on GDP is gonna depend on how you recycle the revenues. If you do it through uh, taxes, and it's whether you do it through taxes and dividends, it's a, little bit, uh, it's a little bit more of a hit. If you do it through a payroll tax cut, it's a little bit less. It's in the one to one and a half uh, percent range. Uh, basically the idea is relative to today's, um, today's prices, you're going to be making capital less efficient and you're going to be investing in less capital and you're going to have a little less GDP per capita. So we're going to have a little bit of a productivity hit. It's a, it's a one-time, sh it's a shift. So you asymptote to a parallel path. And so that's the basic idea there. There's going to be some displacement effects. So there's going to be some initial impact as you hit various sectors uh, with the carbon tax. And, uh, and then there's going to be an overall uh, adjustment to that. So Jim, okay. if you were to ramp it up, so if you introduce it in a phase it in and not in one shot, could you avoid this? this yeah, placement? sure. And so the details of the short term effect are surely going to affect on how, uh, depend on how it's announced and how it's phased in and that sort of thing. So a lot of those are adjustments and uh, th those, would all, those would all be important in practice for sure. Hmm. Um, so what we did, so almost all of this literature is based on the CGE models, which is great because we understand them and they, we know how they work. But on the other hand, uh, it would be really nice to see some plain old empirical evidence and see what the empirical evidence is. It's complementary analysis. So that's what we did uh, in this paper with Gib Metcalf. And we looked, at, uh, we looked at the EU and the EU is a nice experiment here. Uh, there are 31 countries that are in the European Union emission trading system. Uh, 15 of those companies also, uh, countries also have a carbon tax. So the EU ETS covers the power sector. The carbon tax typically covers the transportation sector with a few nuances. So we were able to look at these. These are obviously similar countries in quite a few different, quite a few dimensions. And, uh, and so we were able to look at these um, different countries. They had implemented carbon taxes at different times, at different levels. They changed them at different times. So it's a pretty rich data set. It's a much richer data set than I'm used to uh, where you just have a single country and you're doing macro stuff. So, uh, so here, here's the data source. I'm not gonna go through the data sources. Um, there's a, some literature, here's some literature. Okay, here's the data set. Okay, so these are the countries. You can see they imposed it. This is sorted by year of adoption. So uh, basically the Scandinavian countries plus Poland adopted it early. There's a pretty big range of prices. Uh, this is in 2000, this is the 2018 rate. You know, Finland $71 and Poland is 16 cents. Um, so there's a pretty big range. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then they have a lot of different fractions of coverage. So typically these cover the transportation sector. Norway covers a little bit more than that, but that's why you have these numbers that are in most cases 30, 40% in terms of coverage of emissions. You can see the carbon tax rates have varied a fair amount over time. So they, uh, they get introduced at a certain level and typically they then tip up, tick up and then maybe they make some change and then they go down. We're gonna be able to exploit that. This is a typical plot for a given country. This is Sweden. And you can see they implemented the carbon tax in 1990. 
uh, and then that's just the carbon tax path, and this is the GDP path, and uh, you know, I, I so we're we're, we're going to see if we can find correlations out of this. Okay, all right. So let me uh, just show James, you. There's a question uh, about uh, nonlinearities. So Robert Owen would like to know. Do you exploit these nonlinearities in particular? And because you see substitution effects out of coal into oil, and actually the oil industry might like a, a certain level of carbon tax because it pushes out the coal industry. Yeah, so, so that's actually a really great point, uh, which is, um, I, I want to just pause on that final point. In the US, in terms of the political economy, uh, the, um, there's this centrist group climate leadership council that's been pushing a fee and dividend and a lot of its funding comes from oil companies and that's because the oil companies um, see a small carbon tax as not making much difference in the transportation sector forty dollars a ton is 36 cents a gallon that's not that much but it would basically allow it would basically drive out coal and push up natural gas so a carbon tax actually is good for the balance sheets of a number of the diversified oil and gas companies so that's actually an important point. In terms of the nonlinearities, you'd think that there should be some nonlinearities, like the marginal effect of the of a tax of, you know, going from zero to five dollars is probably different than going from a hundred to hundred and five dollars. And we've played around looking for that. We just can't it, the data just seem not to be able to support that. So, you know, we'll look at that some more, but that just seems to be pushing the data harder than it can bear. Um, this is, uh, this is the effect on GDP growth before and after imposition of a tax. And basically you can't see any, any activity. This is uh, total employment growth. There's actually a small bump up right upon imposition of the tax, but not statistically significant in this usual event study way. Um, this is the effect on emissions from fuel combustion and you can see it go down. And that actually does seem to be sort of significant in the, the usual event study way. Uh, but we'll look at that more carefully. We're actually not doing an event study. These are just some event study pictures that you could uh, you can you can use to get some intuition. What we're actually going to be doing is we're going to be doing uh, basically time series methods, and the time series methods are uh, if you want to think about it, if you just had a single country, what we'd be doing is local projections where we would be making the identification assumption that um, innovation unexpected unexpected shocks to GDP are uh, going to be uncorrelated with contemporaneous carbon tax rates. And so what's the logic of that? The logic of that is that, uh, is that changes, the carbon tax basically has to be set a year in advance. So if you're gonna be taxing fuels, the, you have to, you set that with the annual budget a year in advance. And so the carbon tax rate is actually fixed. So then whatever new, you know, there's going to be a sh an effect of that on GDP. You know, that's what we want to study. But um, anything else that might happen in GDP, like you get hit by COVID or whatever it is, that's just not going to have anything to do with the carbon tax rate, which was predetermined. So it's um, it's a it's a pretty clean uh, predetermined type identification condition. Um, we also, you know, will have fixed effects, country fixed effects, because you want to get around Norway's kind of rich because of all the oil. So maybe that's why Norway adopted a carbon tax, that plus guilt or something like that. Uh, and then uh, we're gonna have um, a year, year effects. Also the year effects aren't really needed in our identification strategy and they don't matter, but they might get at uh, confounders. So that's the, that's the setup. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff that we won't report. So we do both uh, local projections and structural vector autoregressions using the same identification assumption. Uh, the tax rate is an interaction with a coverage share, uh, so, uh, so we'd be able to look at the overall burden on the economy. There is one thing I'll mention now and not return to. Uh, if you recall, I talked about how there's a parallel path, uh, a, a par this parallel path view, which is you have a lower level of the capital stock, and so then that's going to be a, re a, a lower level of GDP as opposed to a change in the growth rate. That's actually testable. Uh, we can test whether there's a growth rate effect or just a level effect, and we don't find any growth rate effect. So all of the results here are going to be imposing that, just looking at the level a level effect. So Jim, there are some questions about how do you define a carbon tax? Because does it include all the other gasoline taxes? We no, have? this is just the carbon. This is just the carbon tax. Okay. This is just the carbon tax. 
Okay, so here's the results. So this is an impulse response function like you might normally see in a macro time series seminar. And it's uh, for these different countries and it's the overall everything pooled result. And what you can see, this is the effect on the growth rate of GDP. Uh, and what, what this imposes is that way out in the very distant future that the growth rate is uh, the growth rate effect is zero, but of course there could be a growth rate effect in the interim, and that growth rate is as you're going to that other parallel path. What you can see, uh, the growth rate effect on GDP is zero after one year, and after after no year, after one year it's like a tiny bit positive, and two years it's tiny bit positive, and then it seems to be a little bit negative, and then it seems to be a little positive, and then it seems to be zero. So that's we basically estimate zero. Uh, this is so for those of you who do time series, this is like one of this is a, a favorite picture for methodological people. This is the same thing done using a structural vector order regression. So I'm going to toggle between these two. And in my experience, this is like never happens. You never get the same answer using local projections and vector order regressions. But Anyway, here you do, and it turns out that the standard errors are bigger in the SVAR, which is kind of interesting. I wouldn't have guessed that, but uh, same answer. When you add up, you might ask, well, what happens if you add these um, up and you look at what the cumulative level effect is? Remember the parallel path says that you're gonna have a hit. It, it, how big is that hit? So you add that up and then how big is that hit? And the answer is that you add it up. And when you add up a small, a number of, a few positive numbers and a few negative numbers, and they're all small, you get no effect. So that's no effect. When you look at employment, there's this weird result in our data <clears throat> uh, where you have a positive effect on employment right at first, and then a little bit of a negative effect and it basically counteracts each other. So there's a little bit of dynamics, but then you could probably be justified about yelling at me since these are all basically within, uh, you know, almost all within a standard error of zero. Um, if you look at manufacturing employment, it's just noisy. So we just couldn't, can't really see anything in manufacturing employment. Um, how about emissions? Well, you put on, you make energy, make gasoline or diesel in, in Europe more expensive and you use less of it. And so that's what you see. So there's less, uh, there's, so the emissions go down. And then it doesn't go, don't, these don't go down by much. They go down by like maybe 3% or 2% to 6% or something like that. And you say, well, gosh, that seems pretty small. Is that reasonable? So here's the back of the envelope calculation. You have a $40 carbon tax, that's about 36 cents a gallon. And I'm doing this in terms of gasoline because that's how we do things in the US. So for European prices, that's about a 7% increase. If you're taking elasticity of minus 0.37, that says that you're gonna have a decline of about 3% in gasoline consumption. Well, gasoline consumption is directly proportional to emissions. So it, it's, it's, it's exactly, I mean, it's exactly the same thing. This is using an elasticity that we estimated. There's a bunch of other elasticity estimates out in the wild, but this is, this is, uh, this, is the, the, it, this all aligns. Okay. That's compared to the overall trend, which is increasing. No? So it's not Sorry? an absolute, it's not clear that an absolute level it will go down because the overall trend is increasing in general. No? Oh yes, yes, yes. This is all. This is all the counterfactual, right? So we're talking about you change the price, change the relative price. So yeah, yeah. No, you still could be going the wrong direction. Yes. You're just going to be shifting and going the wrong direction, not as much. Yes. For sure. For sure. Um, I'm going to skip in the interest of time. We do some things with different types of revenue recycling. So I'm going to skip over that. In the so those are the main results. I want to make sure we have time for the discussion. So I'm going to, I'm going to go back to the original policy problem. So, I, I, so, so the, the basic bottom line there is that we find very small effects on uh, GDP, uh, negligible effects on employment, uh, a small effect, but one that's completely in line with the literature in terms of elasticity estimates on, uh, on, on emissions, and that's in the uh, transportation sector. So then the question is like, well, okay, what would you expect the effects of a carbon tax to be in the United States? And I think that with the GDP and, uh, and uh, employment effects, I'm comfortable extrapolating. 
because the carbon tax in the uh, EU basically hits the transportation sector and in the US, we'd be thinking about it either being, a, being economy wide, it would hit the power sector in the US. We don't have any regulation in the power sector at the national level right now. The question is like, what, what would happen? And here's a simulation that the EIA did last year of really modest carbon taxes, 25 and $35 a ton carbon taxes uh, that then increase at 5% per year. And you remember how their base simulation, which I reported earlier, didn't, it sort of avoided the Paris target. So we went down for a while and then it started going back up again. Well, if you impose a 25 or a $35 carbon tax starting this year in their simulations, you actually find that by 2025, you've hit those Paris targets. And if you go far enough out, you've actually, you know, by 2035, you've actually done a reduction of almost 20% of uh, total emissions in the United States. Uh, most of that is coming from the power sector. So about 90% of that emissions reduction is coming from the power sector in these simulations by the EIA. Uh, and the reason for that, is, and, and not much is coming from the transportation sector. So the reason is not much is coming from the transportation sector is, is the EIA <laughs> kind of doesn't really take electric vehicles on board. It assumes that we're gonna be driving ICEs forever until there's a small elasticity a small price elasticity in transportation. Um, but, uh, but in the power sector is because we're able to substitute and we're able to substitute from coal to natural gas and then substitute from natural gas to wind. And that gives these really big emissions reductions like 60% emission reductions in the power sector by 2035. So Jim, okay. there's a question coming back to the European data. So in Europe, there are also some cap and trade arrangements. How do you take these data into account? As well, yeah. As a, as a so the so so the one of the nice things is <clears throat> all of the countries in our data set are in exactly the same uh, EU ETS. So they're in the same cap and trade system. The cap and trade system covers the power sector. So we're basically holding that constant. And any changes in those, since it's going to be EU wide, they're absorbed in our fixed effects, our our year effects. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so, so um, I want to just say a couple of words about other power sector policies. So we, we've just talked about a carbon tax economy wide. In the current setting, in the current milieu, there's a policy situation. There's a variety of different approaches that are being discussed. And one of them is the, which, you know, the economists love to keep alive is an economy-wide carbon tax. Another possibility would just be a carbon tax applied to the power sector only. Um, another would be something called a clean electricity standard. So a clean electricity standard, the easiest version of it, a binary version of it says that a certain percentage of your electricity has to be from clean sources. So a clean source, clean is different than renewable, so clean, is renewable, so that's wind and solar and geothermal and so forth and hydro, but it also would include nuclear because nuclear is a non-emitting source. Uh, so, uh, and then and then so it's just like 40% has to be from clean sources and the other stuff can be not clean. There's a more complicated version that comes closer to a carbon tax and I'm not gonna discuss that. And then another, th another thing that's on the table is extending investment and production tax credits. So these are a variety of the policy tools that are on the table. Uh, you wouldn't do both a carbon tax and a clean electricity standard. I think these are either or. You could imagine them doing these things in addition, but I think the, I, I like I think these would be plausibly thought of as all either or, uh, different appro separate approaches. There's regulation, so for I don't know how many people here are super in the weeds, but uh, one of the things that uh, you could be forgiven for not noticing on Tuesday was the release of an incredibly important uh, uh, decision by the U.S. Uh, District Court, uh, the St U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia, uh, which is the uh, for which is the uh, uh, the court that oversees EPA national EPA regulations. And what they did is they tossed out. Uh, the um, Trump administration replacement 
for the Clean Power Plan. The Clean Power Plan was the Obama administration regulation of the power sector under the Clean Air Act. The Trump administration withdrew that and replaced it with the Affordable Clean Energy Plan. The Affordable Clean Energy Plan had a couple of problems and the the U.S. Court of Appeals. One of the problems, from a common sense perspective, is that it was they, is, is there was regulating carbon emissions in the power sector. However, once the regulation was imposed, they estimated that it would reduce emissions by one percent. That was actually kind of a point of argument. Some people thought it would increase emissions for technical reasons, but maybe reduce them by one percent. So, what the court said they said two things. First of all you did some legal stuff that was too narrow. And then second of all, it said that your regulation was arbitrary and capricious, that you're told you're gonna go regulate something and you, you say it's dangerous, which they'd said, and then you're gonna reduce it by 1%. And that's just ridiculous. And then they, so basically they have this, you know, 100 and something page ruling saying that that's just ridiculous, which is, uh, it's a tremendously important because it really opens up the door for maybe thinking about this again in, uh, at the administration's level. There's other things you could do in the regulatory sphere like ending the federal coal program, uh, which is actually, which I'll maybe I'll get a chance to talk about later, maybe not, but that's like putting a price, using a supply side policy to put a price on coal, essentially by restricting supply. So you shift the supply curve. And then you can think about stronger state policy. So suppose that somehow they don't do any of these, you could strengthen state policies. Let me just show you a table of some calculations that I've done very recently, or Daniel's more precisely, a graduate student at Harvard has done, Daniel Stewart, uh, and he's used a modification of an electricity dispatch model uh, that's uh, a pretty good one put, by, put together by uh, uh, National Renewable Energy Lab. And, uh, and so, what happens if you have a federal, four, this is looking at three versions of these, and one is a $40 carbon tax, and then you get these substantial emission reductions. These are actually a little bit more than I had showed in that previous simulation. Uh, the average cost is $24 a ton. The reason the average doesn't equal the marginal is because there's a lot of cheaper than marginal uh, or inframarginal gains or some cheap emission reductions uh, early on that you can take advantage of. This is that binary clean energy standard and it's calibrated so that it ends up in the same place, the carbon intensity of the power sector ends up in the same place as these two. You don't get as many emission reductions along the way and it's actually quite a bit more expensive uh, per ton. And that is because it's treating carbon in this binary way, either you're clean or you're dirty versus actually taxing the molecules of carbon themselves. Um, and then there's these extensions, these federal things, and these get a little bit complicated, but one reason to think about why these are pretty uh, low, impact, uh, low impact activities, especially an investment tax credit, is an investment tax credit makes it cheaper to build solar, but it doesn't actually impose any marginal cost on emitting carbon. So you can sort of saturate the place, you know, it saturates it with solar, but if you're still got a cheap coal plant, you'll just run the cheap coal plant until, you know, finally you get driven out. So it, it doesn't really have, it doesn't have much impact because it doesn't, uh, doesn't change anything. The ones that are the real losers here is ramping up state policies. And the reason for that is I can, we can supposedly make power more expensive in uh, New York state or in California or in Massachusetts a lot of that will just leak into, because of the way the system is interconnected, a lot of that will just be leakage into other states and other states will end up producing more coal-fired power uh, to make up for whatever, um, whatever higher cost power we have in our, in our area. So there's big, big differences in the effects of these uh, and big differences in the economic efficiency too. What about the revenue aspects? Of course, the carbon tax will generate revenue as well. Is this negligible, uh, small or? Uh, well, the carbon tax, yeah. So the carbon tax generally generates quite a bit of revenue. Um, I think that, so this, this is just a power sector model. So this doesn't have any of the macro feedbacks mm -hmm. in it. There are no good models in my view that actually have details of the power sector, but also credible macro. 
Uh, there's ones with really bad macro, and there's a good macro with sort of really toy carbon power sector models, but the, but there's nothing that has them both that would be able to do this sort of uh, this sort of simulation. Um, uh, so so I, narrowly, we can't speak to that. Um, so I guess maybe I'll just say one or two things to, to end up here, which is um, how do you think about this going, if you step back, how do you think about this in terms of the broader, uh, the broader question of whether or not this would produce the necessary emissions reductions? And the answer is, you know, this is the carbon tax in the short run is of everything that I know, of, the, know about uh, and everything that's out there in the literature. This is the tool you want if you wanna set ambitious Paris targets, if you want to achieve 60% decarbonization of the power sector doing virtually nothing else, uh, this is the way to do that uh, by 2035. It's not going to solve the problem. It reduces maybe 20% emissions uh, reduction relative to the benchmark of not doing anything, but you can, obviously we need to do much more than that. So the question is, why, why is that? Well, well, what can you do about it? One thing you could do is you could say, well, okay, let's just jack up the rate. So I don't, you know, so maybe this is like, this gets into a political economy world, but it also gets into an economic efficiency world. The IPCC in their special report 1.5, which got a ton of press, uh, which is saying we got to hold things to 1.5 degrees, um, had carbon taxes in their sort of their medium, you know, in, a, in a sort of a fairly uh, not aggressive scenario of being 75 to 125 dollars a ton, increasing at 5% real, which brings you up to you know, in the $500 range by 2050, and some of their scenarios had carbon taxes in the thousands of dollars. So that's, you know, insane. Uh, and that's just simply not gonna happen. Uh, so, uh, you know, you're not gonna solve this by a carbon tax. Uh, and the reason that it makes sense that you wouldn't is that there's not just one externality. It's not just, as Marcus was saying at the beginning, it's not just a, a carbon externality. You've got an R&D externality, which is a standard one in economics. And you've got these extra network externalities or what, what, what Marcus called the QWERTY externality. And then there's um, you know, plenty, plenty of other ones, plenty of other ones too. For multiple externalities, you need multiple tools. So you have multiple targets, multiple tools, pretty, pretty, standard, pretty standard reasoning. So those tools, we talked about the price on carbon. We talked a little bit about the transportation sector. <clears throat> I'll just throw out one factoid. This, this picture, I like this picture a lot. Uh, what this picture shows is it shows early generation, the earliest generation of EVs, the sort of a next generation. This is kind of the generation that we're in now. And what you're noticing is not only these lines getting lower, but they're getting flatter. So what I'm graphing is the price, the MSRP, against the battery range. And a flatter price means that the batteries are getting cheaper. And indeed, the batteries have been getting cheaper at about 16% per year over the last decade or so. If you project this out, so just who knows whether that's right, you just project this out, we're going to hit price parity for um, electric vehicles between 2023 and 2028, depending on where you live. I live in Massachusetts and we have the highest electricity prices in the country. So for me, it's 2028. But if you live in places with low electricity prices, it's 2023, 2024, when you have price parity. At that point, a carbon price could actually make a big difference in terms of tipping people into, uh, into electric vehicles. <clears throat> Assuming that we've solved the QWERTY problem of of making sure that there's enough charging stations. There's green R&D policy. Uh, sorry, there's, there's, um, there's green R&D policy. Uh, and I don't have too much to say about that, not because it's not important. I actually think it's tremendously important. It's tremendously difficult. I think as economists, we don't have enough to say about R&D policy. It's really easy to point, our, to point at lots of bad R&D policy, R&D policy that ends up being inefficient industrial policy, R&D policy that doesn't really achieve anything. Um, I just find it amazing that we've been spending billions and billions and billions of dollars <clears throat> on fusion 
And all of the fusion projects that the federal government has funded have basically just got spent more and more and more. And now there's a private sector, private sector entities coming up with new fusion concepts and getting funding for new fusion concepts that seem to be potentially much more cost effective. They're all based on private sector innovations, not on giant government programs. So I think it's a big need and it's not something we understand very well. Their supply side policies. So I've written on um, keep it in the ground policies in terms of federal coal program reform. Uh, so uh, that's, um, that's uh, that I'm not, again, I'm not gonna get into that. And then there's some really important things in terms of regulatory weeds. Uh, one of the amazing things on the very first day in office, uh, uh, President Biden issued a, a regulatory or issued an executive order where I think it was like in the second or third paragraph, it said that OMB is directed to revise circular A4. So talk about, you know, talk about a really, and those, the other ones are Paris Agreement and stuff like that. Okay. And this one is circular A4. Circular A4 tells you how to do um, a regulatory review and cost benefit analysis. And one of the things that it tells you is that you should use a 3% rate of interest when you're discounting. Well, if you think that uh, the 3% rate of interest was figured out 20 years ago as the prior 30 years ex post real rate on 10 year treasuries, that's where that came from. You look at that today and we know that our star has been going down and that number isn't 3%, it's 2%. And the difference between a 3% and a 2% rate of interest uh, in the social cost of carbon is the difference between a 50 and a $125 social cost of carbon. So there is a reason that circular A4 reform was an EO on the very first day. And then there's a lot of other things that get, uh, that get weedy, but it's all very interesting. And what I would point, I wanna stress is that actually, although they're, they're not all good policies and all the policies are on the table, some of them are really inefficient. There is a logical framework in which these things do actually fit together. So that's, uh, I'll, just, I'll just end it right there, Marcus. Thanks a lot, Jim. A very, very big overview, but also going into the weeds and the details and it shows that you really have you know, spend a lot of time on this topic and uh, you're an expert on that. So let me perhaps start with uh, one question with Denise Mozzarella. Uh, she's also involved in, in the sciences of uh, climate change. Uh, she would like to know about revenue neutral. So if you were to this, you make it revenue neutral, where would you actually then use the revenue? You would you rather use it to you know, fix the other externalities as well, you mentioned, or would you use it to keep it for political reasons, much more paid back in terms of lower labor taxes? Uh, how, where do you see the trade-offs there? Yeah, so that's a great question. <clears throat> and I think that your answer is gonna depend upon, you know, the person's training. Certainly the classical answer to that, the public finance answer is you use it, we have other wedges in the tax system and you use it to pay down the other wedges. So you get rid of employment taxes. Uh, you, get, you reduce the labor tax, you reduce taxes on corporate or, you know, you reduce corporate income tax. We've already reduced the corporate income tax, but, but you could certainly use it to reduce the, the overall income tax rate. So I, I think there's a lot of merit to that, just putting on my hat as a, a macroeconomist. I don't think that's, I don't, I think there's no political chance that that's actually what would happen because there's no credibility that the politicians would say, yeah, we're going to use it to reduce tax rates, but, you know, we'll, we'll see it when you're, you know, believe it when you see it. And, uh, or even not believe it when you see it. Uh, so you don't know how durable that's going to be. So I think the, 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 the most likely outcome, and I think a very reasonable outcome from a political economy perspective is, uh, is that there's gonna be a combination of um, using some of that money to address those extra, other externalities, that is to actually do R&D programs. Now we gotta know how to do them right, but do those other R&D programs. And then um, in addition to a redistribution, so the redistribution done in a progressive way. So it's essentially a, uh, you know, a lump sum where maybe it's more a bigger lump sum if you're in a rural environment or something along those lines, or a bigger lump sum if you happen to be in Ohio, which is a heavy coal area versus being in California, which is uh, you know, pr already pretty green. So you're gonna have less of a cost to bear from a carbon tax. So, so I think that, um, I think that's a very plausible idea. Just saying about the political economy, I think there's a big advantage of that from a political economy perspective too. 
Because if you build in a lump sum redistribution, it creates an advocacy or a success for the policy. And what we have to have, what we have to have is we have to have durable policy. Where I started out was that, yes, we've had emission reductions that are substantial since 2005. It has nothing to do with policy. We need to have policy to drive the remaining emissions reductions or else we're just going to go back to where we were. And that policy has to stick and it has to be something that people can plan on and it has to be something that firms can invest, you know, invest in. And, and that requires that the policy has to be durable and to make the, the carbon tax durable. I think that the cap and the fee and dividend approach is, is really a good way to do that. So I have two more questions which I want to throw at you. One is about ESG. Uh, so if you think a carbon tax is, is you know, one way to go forward, and an alternative story is that we, through financial regulation, the private markets will drive it, and we just make it for firms to produce dirty energy uh, more expensive. If you compare the, the weight of the two, how, of course, we have to do both, but which one is, you know, is the ESG tiny compared to a carbon tax, or is carbon tax tiny to, you have fact show there's not much of an impact ultimately, is ESG more powerful to just increase the cost of capital or funding? So, so that is a terrific question. And there is not as much research. There, there's, uh, the short answer is that is a great researchable question. So how effective is ESG on actually producing real outcomes? Now, what we've had is there is a literature on how effective is ESG. What if you have ESG announcements what are the effects on, for example, stock prices or required capital returns? And so, you know, I have an undergraduate who did her thesis mm -hmm. on um, on what's the effect of uh, what's the effect of uh, university announcements that they're going to divest in coal on coal stocks, and you see a little effect. So you see little effects. There would be increasing cost of capital for ESG type things, mm -hmm. uh, and the question is, do these actually add up to enough? that the cost of capital would be so high that then that gets built into the prices. I am, I will say my opinion, my, this is my opinion, I am very skeptical. So I'm very skeptical that you sort of take these little ESG things and you then increase the cost of capital by, I don't know, maybe, maybe increase it by 150 basis points. You know, it still is like gasoline, <clears throat> you know, of course 150 basis points when you have that go through the entire refinery system down to the price of gasoline. I mean, how many pennies a gallon are we talking and how much of a difference is that gonna make? And I think that the answer is like, it's gonna make a really tiny difference. So by and large, I would put myself in the camp of people who are skeptical of all of, all of these, what I would call supply side policies. Mm -hmm. There are some special exceptions. One of them is the US federal coal program because it has such a huge footprint. Um, but even that, it turns out there's some legal problems with actually doing anything without changing laws and so forth or buying people out. So I, I guess in most of these cases, I view these as more sort of messaging things, you know, like uh, th than anything that's actually going to solve the climate problem. But that's it. There's like a dearth of research on ESG. But the first research you would recommend is to have to say, how does 150 basis points trickle through ultimately to the gasoline price. Sure, for example, that would be a good calculation. And then there's lots of, there is research on ESG on required returns and on financial things. And then you wanna see, well, how does, does that actually, how does that actually change either firm behavior? Does, do firms mm -hmm. then somehow say, yes, I'm going to adopt an internal carbon price and then make decisions based on that? Or how does it percolate down to prices of goods and services and energy and so forth? I think those would be, that'd be a great thing to do research on. Now, let me move to the international arena a little bit. So of course, there's a big debate between Europe and the US and they might follow very different approaches. So it could be that uh, Europe moves ahead and has a cap and trade system much more strict imposed while the US is focusing more on industry specific uh, taxes. So industry regulation. How would you see the border adjustment tax to take this into account? You know, you have these two different ways of dealing in two different continents and you have to somehow make the international trade fair. Have you seen any work on this dimension or? Yeah, so there's, there's, there's definitely a fair amount of work on um, border adjustment taxes. I think the, you know, it gets, 
talk about weeds, I mean, that gets really complicated really quickly because you have to take into account the other entities. You have to figure out what the embedded carbon price is uh, on a good that you're importing. And in some high car, high, like if it's steel, you can maybe have a chance of doing that. And if it's, you know, like clothing, I don't know. I mean, it seems incredibly difficult to do that. So there are there are people who try to get at that, but you need to understand not just the you know petroleum content of these goods or the energy content of these goods, but what you know what aspect of that was regulated in the exporting country. Mm -hmm. So um, it's uh, that's a really that's a really hard that's a really hard question. I think that the best you're going to be able to do is like have some crude approximation that would stand withstand some legal challenges. So I think I think that's that's hard. I, I am actually I really hope that the premise of that question is wrong, and I don't think it needs to be uh, that at all. I think that we we're already, we are the reason I'm talking about this today rather than sort of a more traditional put on my macroeconomist type talk is that I think that we're right now. I mean, this week, next several months, at a unique moment in American history where we could actually really do something significant uh, that would at least be power sector wide that would be really efficient and uh, possibly even be econo economy wide that would be a very good first step combined with other policies. So we have a tradition in this webinar series that we end with a positive note and you started already going that way. I just can you give me some projection? Will we bring the CO2 emissions down or what's your projection in the next 20 years? Uh, if Oh, yeah. I'm, so first of all, we have to. So we will. So we have to. And the question to me is how efficiently will we do it? I mean, it, it is incredible. So I served in, I served in uh, the Obama administration and I left in, in 2014. It is unbelievable how the landscape has changed in the last six years. So for a while, everybody was fighting over is, you know, the climate denial stuff. Well, that now that's behind us. I think there's, there's absolutely no intellectual content there and that's just been dismissed. Uh, and, 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 and in contrast, all of the momentum is with youth movements that have been insistent that we who screwed up actually get something done. And uh, this administration seems to have taken that on board, and uh, and I think this is an opportunity to to actually to actually do things not not just aggressively but aggressively and efficiently, yes. and that's where the economists have to keep trying to keep up with all of these big changes. Thanks a lot, Jim. It was very insightful. A lot of rich. Uh, analysis and data and um, looking forward to read more on this topic from you. Thanks. Thanks again. Hope to see you soon. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus.